First of all, you don't know me. <laughs> We're all about that high school drama girl, drama girl, all about them high school queens. We'll take you for a ride in our comic girl, drama girl, cheering for the right team. Drama queens, drama queens, smart girl, rough girl, fashion but you're tough girl, you could sit with us girl. Drama queens, drama queens, drama queens, drama, drama queens, drama queens. Sophia, tell them what episode we just watched. Friends. Family, even foes at home. We've even just watched. <laughs> For all of you who hate listening. For right all now. of you who hate it, we've watched season four, episode 14, Sad Songs for Dirty Lovers. The irony that this episode aired on frickin' Valentine's Day in 2007 is not lost on me. Oh, sh- this was Valentine's Day? Yes! How f- up oh, is that's that? A doozy. All right, right. Valentine's Day 2007. Haley confronts Brooke regarding the stolen calculus test. Lucas and Peyton consider taking their relationship to the next level. As Peyton and Brooke finally, finally grow closer, thank fucking God. Mm. Uh, And then in Deb's absence, Nathan throws a senior party at the Scott house where a sex tape from Nathan's past Mm. surfaces. Our director was Janice Cook. She was the female director on the show that we were very fond of. Mm -hmm. She was good at parties. I feel like she really, like, handled this one. Yeah, she did. She did a great job. It felt like a real high school party, man. It did. God, I don't even know where to start. I mean, I guess... Well, here's what I want to know. (laughs) What'd you do to piss the writers off? Because between Brooke stealing the test and then, like... Mm boldly just lying about it to her best friend mm. um and then brooke with this doozy of a sex tape i mean <sighs> look, no spoilers here we all know what happened uh, yeah what'd you do they made you the bad guy this episode i don't know man you know it's interesting because the the stealing of the test and you know having everything you want so close that you can almost touch it and then having something threaten it i like the dramatic foil and i like I like in a way that as Brooke is trying to be a better version of herself, Rachel kind of pushes her into, you know, three years ago, Brooke. Like, mm-hmm. I-, I like the push and pull of it. I like that she feels stuck between a rock and a hard place. I- I've certainly been there when when you're a-, a part of something and you don't really know. I mean, this is granted her being fully, you know, 50% of the guilt here. Like, they stole that test together. But... I, I, I've witnessed people that I love do things that aren't great and not known where it's my place to speak up or not. And so yeah. I guess in that way, where, where you kind of go like, oh, I don't know if I should say anything. Maybe I, maybe I should just stay on the periphery, which at this stage in my life, I don't think is the best course of action. But in our early 20s, I mean, God, we got really trained to be such people pleasers, to always be good on set, to never yeah. have a problem, to never, you know, never, never be the squeaky wheel. And so I think those were the ways I really related to Brooke in this position of, I don't want to hurt Haley, and I don't want to get Rachel in trouble, and I don't want to lose my future, and and maybe if I can just white-knuckle it over the line, it'll all be okay. Is it really a big deal anyway? You know, all the lies you tell yourself. Oh, yeah. And then, so it's like, that, that I can kind of get. But man, when I read that <laughs> tape scene, I was like, I'm not doing it. And they were like, you're doing it. And I was like, I'm not doing this. I will not do this. James had to talk me off a ledge. And like, we've talked a lot, y'all, about how this was sort of the year that like our baby James grew up. And Mm -hmm. he was like, it's all going to be okay. I'm going to take care of you. Don't worry, Soph. Like, he really came in like a Boy Scout. And I was like, I don't want to do this, man. I was so upset. I thought it was so unforgivable. And then, no spoiler alert exactly, but the fucked up thing is that for the fans at home who know what episode's coming next, there's the flashback to the night that this happens between Brooke and Nathan. And the episode opens on, you know, sophomore year or whenever this was supposed to be, junior year, with Peyton being in such a mood. And I don't know if you remember, but you say two of the meanest things I've ever heard a human say. First to Nathan and then to Brooke. And basically they're like, f*** her. And they, they like drunkenly have sex as revenge, even though she's broken up with him. And when episode 415 aired, they cut it all out. So it just looks Wait, like- Wait, what? Brooke, I don't remember this. Yes. They cut the, the, the 
awful things that Peyton says to Brooke, which I'll tell everyone about next week. They cut them. And it. And I remember watching the episode on TV and crying. And I was oh, like, you've no. made her. Yeah. I was like, you've made her unforgivable. It does like, feel a little like character assassination. Oh. It's death to Brooke in this yeah. episode, man. I don't know. Oof. Our boss was probably pissed because he tried to grab my ass again. And I told him to go fuck himself. So he made me pretend yeah. to have sex with Nathan instead. I mean, not a bad trade, my dude. Like- Honestly, <laughs> James Lafferty is a gentleman. So, you know, if you had to pick one, you, you'd yeah. always go to that side. If you're going to go down swinging, <laughs> I, you know, cool. This episode gave me tremors. I've got my kids, you know, like we're hiding out here in North Carolina. I'm at the scene of the crime. I'm back yeah, in you North are. Carolina. And it's just Chad and I rolling around the whole episode. And you're I like, keep get out for my kid to walk in. And I'm like, <laughs> mom's on her bra. Be cool. Be cool. Calm um, down, babies. There was so much talk in this episode about sex. Like, let's Ugh. do the damn thing between, you know, between Brooke and not Chase and Brooke and Nathan and Peyton mm-hmm. and Lucas and Mouth and Shelly. Mm-hmm. And who else is having sex? Not having. I mean, Dan's coming on to Karen. Everybody's He's trying. Like pushing that button. And so yeah. much talk about love. Mm. All I could think was like when I was a senior in high school, I was like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. I don't love anybody. Like I'll make out <laughs> with a different person every weekend. So this idea that like teenagers are so fixated on finding like the great big huge love of their life mm. was like funny for me this episode. Oh, I enjoyed man. the novelty of I have to be with someone. It's prom. Well, I think I love. get that. And maybe it's because I went to an all girls school. So I didn't, I didn't really have the luxury of like, oh, everybody's just kissing everybody. It was like, who's your person? Because we were just watching rom coms and, shit, you know. Yeah. So I think that I think that we were much more um, in the world of TV fantasy. And oh man, senior prom was such a big deal. And yeah. what was going to happen when we go off to college? We're going to stay together, right? Like everybody really was in this heightened sort of sense of reality that you see in our show which is probably because we had no reality we were just copying what we were watching on tv yeah i mean i feel like (laughs) we talked a lot about our show created a new normal uh in certain respects for the generation of girls that were watching it when they were in high school um do you know anyone from your pack of friends that married or is still with the person that they were with when you were you know, going to prom. I have three. Do you really? But not I from mean, my I've school. Got a bunch, but you know, I'm from yeah. the South, man. It's a different deal. Yeah, not from my school. My girlfriend Amanda, who lives in Chicago, is with her middle school sweetheart. Shut One up. of my best friends, Alicia, who you've hung out with in New York, oh, yeah. is married to her, I mean, junior high sweetheart. You know, at 13, he carved their initials in a tree at summer camp. That's really cute. And then. Yeah, I've got one other girlfriend who was so in love with this boy she went to church with, and they were <laughs> together, and then in college they weren't, and then they wound up getting back together and getting married. Um, and then my baby cousin, my cousin Shelby, is married to her uh, her high school sweetheart. But they're all from, like, one Pasadena, one Texas, one Chicago, one New York. Like, they're all over the place. Yeah, they're all over the place. I love when I go home that so many of my classmates are still with the person that they went to prom with Mm. or, you know, that they were dating during football season, you know, and their weddings were all super, super fun because it was a Mm. high school reunion. Um, Yeah. I can't just, I don't know why I can accept in real life, but then when I see it on TV and I'm like, these fucking kids talking about being in love, (laughs) it's like exhausting (laughs) to me. Maybe it's because I'm in a parental situation now where I'm like, honey, don't lock yourself in. Go, yeah. be free, explore. It'll yeah, be you're like, it's all you. ridiculous. And the thing is, in most of the world, sort of statistically, it is. But I, I do think you're, you're in that really interesting moment, right, where you're desperate to leave the nest, but you've also mm-hmm. known nothing else. You think you're an adult, but really you're a child. And, you know, you, you want to adultify yourself, And being in love, being independent when you're about to go to college feels like a big way to, you know, mark the territory of your identity. I'm an adult. No one embodied (laughs) that better 
than Lee Norris in this episode. Oh Lee my Norris God. is so in love with Shelly after having dated Gigi for the last couple months and just yeah. starting to date Shelly. And I appreciated that because it was real. That was real. Like, that boy wants yeah. to be in love. He wants to yeah. lose his V-card. He wants to go to college and be able to, you know, be a man. I'm a man from yeah. Tree Hill, not a boy. A man, you know man. what I have to say, though, made me sad? Because to your point, Lee acted this episode beautifully. Mm -hmm. He put real emotion into what he was given. The words mm -hmm. on the page, he made them real. And something that I appreciated watching it now that I don't think I appreciated when the episode aired was that this was really the first time you were seeing a boy say, I'm crazy about you and I don't know what to do about it. And I, I, I'm not pushing you away. You're pushing me away. And I don't understand. Yes, I want to be with you. Am I not supposed to? You yeah. know, but, but he's not saying in those sentences, you know, I want to be with you. So why do you care? He's not doing that gross trope, but, but I have this real letdown and I can tell in the way that some of those scenes jump that they were edited down. So I know uh -huh. there's dialogue missing, which I think does a real disservice to the conversation Mouth and Shelley are having. And I think they really made Mouth and Shelley's story in this episode. They put it firmly in the B storyline space when it should have had an A storyline. Yeah, absolutely. Because it makes it, by by shrinking the amount of time they're on screen together, they have conflated uh, desire and confusion. They've conflated mouth believing he's being rejected because he's not enough, which is mm -hmm. his core wound, with Shelly not knowing how to communicate that she, her core wound is that she's afraid that if she has sex again, everything will come crashing down. So instead of having this really interesting experience where he could get vulnerable about feeling like he's never chosen and mm -hmm. she could say, all I want to do is choose you, but I don't think I can choose you without choosing myself. And they could get somewhere really kind. The, they rushed it and, and they made his expressions of his own vulnerability read as being completely manipulative of her. And all too often we see boys pressure girls into sex. And I've seen that scene a million times. I don't feel like that's what was on the page here. But they kind of edited something that felt vulnerable into something that felt manipulative. And it kind of has a foot in each mm -hmm. world. And I really don't like the result. Well, I mean, that probably is reality. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that we saw a boy crying about yeah. sex that's what i mean like his vulnerability is beautiful american pie came out when we were in high school dude and like yeah. i remember being at parties where people wanted to watch it and just being so kind of creeped out because i was like i'm still a virgin is this the way you boys talk behind our backs like, yes being really weirded out yeah because all my guy friends were laughing at it and they were like yeah but you know whatever well yeah i had just the summer before season four i'd gone up to canada to shoot john tucker must die and the scene where we watch all the boys in that movie talking about, you know, the lead girl, Kate, Brittany Snow, they're like chanting uncorker and porker, uncorker oh and porker. Like, it's disgusting. Yeah. And and that was, to your point, all of our representations of how, how men... boys wanted to lose their virginity. Yeah. And, and so I guess that's why I feel bummed, because this was like, this was a boy really saying, like, I don't know if I'm attractive to you. I don't know... If you feel the way about me I, that I feel about you and, and I'm, I'm, I have all these emotions and all these feelings and of course I want it to be you, but they like, they cut it off and I wanted more of that honesty for both of them. And, and what I, what I feel like we wound up with was something where a lot of people watched this and went, I feel like he pressured her into sex and that. That really felt he like guilted, a letdown. It felt guilty, man. Yeah. It felt yeah. guilty, and that's not what Lee was performing. No. You know, like, yeah. I, is he the first male character on our show that we're seeing lose his virginity? Yeah. Oh, like, <laughs> I mean, I love that he played it as emotional as he did, because had he been any other dude, he would have been, like, firm with her like you've led me on and blah 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 and Ew. instead lee does it with tears in his eyes and is like legitimately confused so yeah. 
kudos to him for nailing it. But um, it did feel like a guilt thing. Like, fine, I gave you the thing that you wanted. Can you leave me alone now? And by the way, I've done that in real life, in my youth. Just like, fine, you've pressured me. I've given you the thing that you wanted. Can Mm -hmm. we stop? Like, can you just Mm -hmm. stop calling me? Mm -hmm. And it's the, I threw up. You know, Mm -hmm. like, it's the grossest feeling as a woman to be pressured into that. And, oh, God, I just, like, thank God we got Liz to do it. I know. Because she... She's so good, and she's she just so looks good. like a baby, and you want to protect think, her. I think what made it hard is because they were both so good. They put so much into it that gave it nuance. But I think I, I just I had the real feeling that some of that nuance wound up on the cutting room floor because mm-hmm. the episodes have to be cut for time. And what what was odd to me was that it wasn't a clear cut case of like he guilt tripped her she was like i want it i want it so bad i want it so bad i can't be around you and look if i'm around you i'm gonna have sex with you and then i have to run away from you because sex is shameful you know she Mm -hmm. says i he says i know you're a clean teen and she says i'm the clean teen yeah so what we're getting at is that shelly has built an identity for herself that she's afraid to lose and that's interesting but we don't go past one quick reference to it and and it's like it's like she's a secret. Basically, they made this whole thing like he thinks she isn't attracted to him. And she is, in fact, a secret nymphomaniac who has to run away because sex is bad. And it's like, what the? F- what is this? And I can't even look at you. I can't even look at you. I can't be next to you. It, it just made me feel sad because they're both such talented actors. And I wanted more of the vulnerability. I wanted more of him thinking he knew what she was saying and mm-hmm. her not being able to say what she needed to say and them having a a tete-a-tete in that manner until they got to a point where they both got vulnerable and got to say, no, that's not it. It's that I am fill in the blank. Yeah. Like, I wanted that. Well, to your point, I I loved the line at the beginning of the episode where Mouth literally says, it's about them, the clean teens. (laughs) And then it cuts to a shot of all the kids in their T-shirts. But that... That's very real. Like, my identity was so wrapped up in my virginity in high school because Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm the good girl. I'm the Mm -hmm. girl that, like, follows all the rules. That when I went away to college and came home and was not a virgin anymore, I felt like everyone was going to judge me Mm -hmm. and I completely lost my sense of self. And so that feeling of trial by the jury of your peers when Mm -hmm. you're forming your identity Mm -hmm. is... There's so much there. And we made a snack instead of a meal. Yeah. It would have been a delicious meal. Yeah. I just, I really wanted that storyline to be given its due rather than to be just in the slideshow of scenes at a party. Mm hmm. You know? Well, speaking of other B storylines that should have been A storylines, we have to dissect Dan and Karen because oh. why am I nostalgic for their high school years? Like best I know. Step. Also, I love, well, two things. Well, as soon as you said nostalgic for their high school years, I'm like, God, yeah, that shot of them in the yearbook, mm-hmm. gorge. I want more of that. I, I wanted to actually see like a flashback to their prom. I, I wonder if we're going to get it. But uh, why does Dan just walk into Karen's house? I just pulled up my notes. And at yeah. the top the of my notes, note. <laughs> what is that? Why does he constantly just walk into her house? Tree Hill's weird, man. No, he's got locks. And like all these women have had terrible things happen to them. And they're just like, I don't know. Whatever. Doors. We don't even have doors. We just have like tent flaps at the front of our house. Yeah. Come on. Um, he does just walk into her house, and maybe that's to illustrate his level of comfort with her at this point. Because hmm. since Keith died, he's really been playing that card of, I yeah. forgot. Doesn't he say it? Oh, he, he says it. Yeah. Later at in dinner. The episode, when they're on their not a date date. Not date. She says, I'm pregnant with your brother's child. And he says, but you're also alone. I want to be the man you turn to. That's what my uh-huh. notes say. Uh-huh. Ew! Right after that. But also, here's what I was thinking about a little bit, though. Um, hmm. They're only 36 years old. Yeah, 36 like, or 37. 
Wait, no. Are they even that old? Well, because they're 36 when the show starts. But every season of the show is, every two seasons of the show is one year. But if they were 18 when they had Lucas, yeah. and Lucas is now 18, that's 36. Oh, yeah. So yeah. they must have been, God, so they were like 35 in season one. Okay. God bless them. So they're like Ooh. 36 years old, and that's still very young. And Karen hasn't, I mean, I guess what? She's dated Andy. She's dated Keith. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's still, um, I can understand her level of optimism mm-hmm. where this man has hurt her for 18 years. Mm-hmm. Could it be that she, there's redemption there. It's like, if he ends up being a good guy, yeah, it absolves her of the poor decision-making she made when she was a teenager. Yeah. And there's a little bit of like hero complex where it's mm-hmm. like, I, I did made you a good guy, you know, mm-hmm. like not anybody else, you know, nobody else in your life could make you a good guy, but yeah. I did. And we all have egos. If I, yeah. if I was dealing with like a huge toll and I got them to behave, I'd be really proud of myself. Yeah. And so I can fully understand why Karen is like, Okay, fine. It's also one of the number one ways that manipulators and narcissists do what they do is they look at you and they (laughs) say, yeah, I know I've, I know I've been a bad guy, but you make me want to be different. Yeah. Listen, I'm a, I am a sucker for that. Sophia, I love it. I'm like, tell me more. I want to eat a spoon. (laughs) The entire decade of, I've had phases in all my decades of that. Let's just, let's leave it at that. But that's the thing is, is someone who says, I've behaved badly because I've never felt safe. I've behaved Mm. badly because no one's ever really loved me. I've behaved badly because I grew up in a terrible environment. You make me feel safe. You make me want to change. You make me realize I can be the man I want to be. That is seductive as hell. Yeah, I get it. I, if I'm Karen and tall, Mm -hmm. handsome Dan is buying my son tuxedos and Mm -hmm. like, he is showing up with consistency. This isn't Mm -hmm. once in a while. It is this man walking into her house every other day. And we've watched it over the course of the last, what, six episodes? Um, He is consistently like, you're great. I'm here. I'm saying the right words. Mm -hmm. I totally understand, but I'm frustrated with myself as a viewer that I'm falling for it. I know. But... It's also really interesting because you realize how easy it is in a moment. You, you forget your memories. Mm-hmm. You forget the past. You know, it's like what so many of my girlfriends, you included, have talked about with having kids. Where you're like, yeah, childbirth is insane. If you remembered it, you'd never do it yeah. again. You block that shit out. Man. You block it out. Like Karen has all these terrible memories with Dan but here he is day after day, week after week, showing up, being the best version of himself. And but, but but hold on. Let's pause there for know? a second. Does she have terrible memories with Dan? Because it seems like there was mm. a vacuum. It seems like there was an absence, right? So rather right. than her interacting with him on a regular basis like Deb did over the course of the last 18 years, yeah. Deb's had an eyeful, right? Mm. Karen just had... 16 years of nothing and had to hypothesize what he might be up to or what kind of parent he might be. And so maybe that absence is actually working in his favor right now because Mm. she doesn't have all of the experience that Deb has, who is like clearly still struggling. Yep. That's a great point. That's a really great point because Karen's pain points with Dan are a long time ago. And yeah, there have been things, you know, him trying to get in the way when Lucas joined the team. Sure. I'm sure there were times when Lucas was a kid and Dan would refuse to pay for things, you know. There was that whole thing about how she never took any child support from him. But I would imagine that there was some sort of battle that got them there. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe, like, not. maybe I mean, she may- yeah. was one of those chicks that was like, you know what? Fuck you, I'll figure it out. You yeah, know? might have been. Nature abhors a vacuum. It will fill it. Well, if there's a vacuum, what a what an empathetic person does is say, oh, yeah. God, I made all these assumptions over 16 years. I didn't approach Dan 
And mm-hmm. look how wonderful he's being right now. Yeah. Did did I rob my son of an opportunity? Did I rob my son of this relationship? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, he's just working that. Um, he is. He's working. But by that. the way, has never been more charming. No, has never been more charming. Has never been more magnetic. Mm-hmm. And not only does she witness the way he's being with Lucas in front of her. She sees him giving Lucas advice and a person to confide in, I guess doesn't see him rather, I should say hears. She hears it through the door. She hears them forming their own relationship. Dan saying, hey, I see you like no one else can see you. It'll be our secret. He's creating a, a, a sort of avenue where Lucas can confide in him and where he can have a parental male figure in his life and karen is listening to that and then in they come with the door and dad bought his kid a tux Mm. and it's all it's very sweepingly romantic oh god when he asks her to prom and she's like oh are you asking me to prom and like flustered she's pumped yeah pumped it feels good yeah we can feel karen's Relief almost, because Mm -hmm. if you fall for an asshole, it makes you second guess every decision you make, whether it's personal or professional. Oh, yeah. But if that asshole ends up coming around and you can write it off as like, that was a bad chapter for him. But what I saw was real. What I saw was real. I was right. There's just a relief because it means you're not crazy. It means you weren't duped that you saw something that actually existed. Yeah. And oh, I feel so bad for her. Mm. Deb. Oh. <gasps> Deb. It is it is a wild thing. And you know, I have to say there are things that just don't age well. The way that Nathan speaks to Deb about her alcoholism, which again was written for mm-hmm. the character to say mm-hmm. is so upsetting to me. Yeah. Him calling it a weakness and saying it is not a disease when we literally know that addiction is a disease. It's so dismissive and cruel. And it's like, why and, did he even bother <laughs> to visit her that day? Well, and by the way, maybe it's all to set up that he says to Haley, I think I was too hard on my mom. So Haley can say, well, why don't we move in with her? Let's be the martyrs. Let's be the heroes. Let's help. Yeah. You know, maybe they thought, well, he's really got to be terrible to Deb if he if he's going to vent about it to Haley. But man, that that was hard. Yeah, yeah, that was really difficult to watch because it's not like it's not like he showed up and he was dismissive of her excuses. It's not like she was mm-hmm. like, "I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry," and he was just like, "Uh huh, uh huh." You know, which is probably more like what a teen boy would do. He showed up with like things he wanted to say and they cut to the quick. Like he said hurtful things. Mm -hmm. Peyton's mom had an illness. You're just weak. Yeah. You said it. You were like, that's Dan Scott's son. Yeah. That's some Dan Scott level manipulation. And it was very, I was very taken aback to see it from Nathan. And I think it was hard You know, as we were talking about it when the episode was on, you also said, because I expressed my frustration, that he was demeaning the -hmm. severity of what alcoholism is. And you said he's also demeaning the abuse she has survived. Well, well, yeah, dude. Like, like, she's an abuse survivor. It goes it goes back and forth with Nathan a lot. We're like one minute. He's team mommy where he's like, mommy, we've survived Dan and his wrath and the reign of terror. And then the next minute he like completely forgets and it's like, oh, is your life so hard living in that big expensive house with, you know, like whatever. I don't believe that shit came out of that kid's mouth. No, it's wild. And, and the irony, I mean, I know there's a lot of time between 2007 and now, but the irony of all the things we've learned. Do you remember that study that came out? That said, yeah, look, money no, can buy you no, safety. No, I'm going to tell you right now that I don't because you're the data nerd. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, I'm sorry. But this is actually really interesting. There's a study that came out a couple of years ago that talked about, like, you know, everyone always says money can't buy happiness. And it's like, well, yeah, but money can buy you security. It can buy you experiences. It can sure. buy you health care. 
And those things are all great, but they've actually proven that money makes an incremental difference in your year, in in your life, up to the threshold where you take home 70 grand a year. Like the difference between taking home 40 grand a year and 70 grand a year is a big, big difference. Yeah. Past 70 grand a year into multi-millions. They, they've like proven that money doesn't make you any happier, which I find really interesting. And it, there's a, you know, it's like cliches are cliches because they're true. That's why we say them all the fucking time. And so if money can't buy you happiness, how interesting to look at someone like Deb and even someone like Nathan mm-hmm. who have every privilege human beings could possibly be afforded and they're both suffering and mother and son are both suicidal And you can have this conversation about abusive relationships and how success is the illusion and what's really going on behind the scenes. And here is a kid. We've talked about this all season. Nathan is on suicide watch. He's been crying out for help. And then his mother has a suicide attempt. And he walks in and goes, really, mom? Suicide? Thanks for the note. It, It felt so out of character for Nathan's journey that I almost feel like in an early version of the script, it was a Dan scene. And then they decided because they wanted Haley and Nathan to move in with Deb that Nathan should go instead. And they just didn't really rewrite the scene. Well, it, whoever wrote Nathan this episode hasn't been watching all of season four because yes. he also goes to Lucas when Lucas is at the party, hiding out in a bedroom, looking at mm. the picture of Keith. And he's like, you got to get over it, man. Keith yeah. is gone. Meanwhile, he's the one that was haunted by Keith for infinity f***ing episodes. Yes. Of this season. It's so bizarre. I Again, there's there's great stuff in this episode. And I love the we're getting close to graduating and we just won state and there's a lot of nostalgia. I love that they threw a party. I love that they threw a party, but, but the actual scenes between the characters, Mouth and Shelly, Nathan and Deb, Nathan and Lucas, they, they kind of feel like they don't make any sense. (laughs) I'm like, who are these people? Has anybody been watching our show? The kids who are not economically well off Hmm. are significantly happier than the kids who are. Because Rachel, as you know, she's in a bad place. Torpedo to life. Is dealing with a bunch of bad shit. Nathan, you've got Deb, and then like the happy go lucky ones are skills, you know? (laughs) Karen's having a great time living in a little house, you know? And Hmm. Peyton is finally happy. You know, like the kids who um, were part of the river court scene. Yeah. Are, with the exception of mouth, yeah. are seemingly doing much better. It is and just. Maybe because there's not as much pressure on them. You yeah. know what I mean? When you're from a wealthy family and it's like, okay, well, what do I do once I'm kicked out of the nest? Mm. You know, that can be frightening. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very curious with it in particular for Rachel because you see what she's doing. And I love the scene between me and Daniil when Brooke chases her out of the party and asks yeah. what's been going on. And Rachel explains. And there's nothing that Brooke can say but thank you. And oh she means God. it. Yeah. Oh, look at you just clutching your chest, you cutie. No, listen, I know, that really got said, you. <laughs> it really, when Rachel said, you're my friend, Brooke, mm. I felt that sh- in my bones i I felt it and it was like for brooke who is in a battle with her best friend peyton Mm -hmm. and who has just lied to her other best friend's face right Mm -hmm. and so that feels bad that feels bad when you're fighting with your friends you know nobody likes that to have this girl say to her i'm willing to sacrifice my future because yours is so bright Mm -hmm. you're my friend brooke like i loved that 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 was probably my favorite moment of the episode. Yeah. That was my favorite. Especially for Brooke, who doesn't feel like people bet on her. Yeah. Well, she also feels like it's really easy for people to remove Brooke, you know? And and that can feel bad when it's like, oh, Peyton seems fine without me. And my parents are fine without me. And my ex-boyfriend yeah. is fine without me. And I moved out of Haley's apartment so Nathan could move back in. And she's fine without me, you know? Mm-hmm. To have someone prioritize you the way Rachel has done. I wish you two had ended up together. What a cute Oh my couple. God. I know. Wouldn't that have been so fun? But it's, yeah. 
it's again, it, it reinforces the, the ways that, especially I think those two girls are stuck. Mm-hmm. Brooke is stuck. She doesn't want to hurt Haley, but she doesn't want to hurt Rachel. Mm-mm. Rachel knows she got Brooke in trouble, but realizes how much worse it's going to be if Brooke gets caught now. Yeah. Wants to be Brooke's friend and has finally found a place where she fits in. And you realize the magnitude of this, you know, expulsion when she's putting away her little box from Tree Hill High and you Ugh. see it lined up against all the rest of the schools and you realize that nobody bets on Rachel either. It happens again and again and again, even if she is self-sabotaging, even if she's doing it so that it can't be done to her. It's, oh, it's just heartbreaking. She's always, like, with the exception of trying to hook up with Nathan, she's always on the moral up and up. Like, mm. I love the character of Rachel because I love a, an anti-hero, you mm. know? A little Taylor Swift reference <laughs> for the kids. I was um, just going to ask. I was going to be like, oh, somebody listen to Midnight's. <laughs> that's a bop. Um, do the kids say bop anymore? I don't know. I, don't I like know. the word. I appreciate an anti-hero, and Rachel is, you know, the perfect example of that. And yeah. she doesn't try to defend herself to Haley. She takes the hit. She leaves when she's told to leave. Like, that takes a big person mm-hmm. to do the walk away. Mm-hmm. And I don't I don't think she gets enough credit for I that. Agree. You know? I just, agree. Great. You guys have your fun. I serve my purpose here. I'm out. Yeah. Ugh. <sighs> This isn't the end of Rachel, though, is it? Like, where is she going to go? Did did they say she's expelled? I thought that's what the principal threatened, but maybe not. I don't know. He, like, when he's passing out that test, (laughs) he's just staring at the back of your head. I was like, so we had some, like, cheating scandals when I was in high school. And they don't really do anything about it. Kids, just so you know, (laughs) they don't. Really do, do anything about it. You can oh, cheat God, in I was, high school. You can? Yeah. Oh, so man. remember, listen, I didn't cheat in high school. I definitely cheated in college. Because remember, at the beginning of the internet, when you could buy papers? Oh, my God. I would never. What? <gasps> Hillary! Girl, I was a VJ. I was busy. I was working 40 hours a week. I Damn. Write. I mean, I know you were busy. I just would never. I now listen. There was one paper. There was one paper on Gulliver's Travels. And I... <laughs> Could not do it. And so I bought it online, but it was like at the beginning of the internet. So teachers weren't savvy to just like searching for sentences. Yeah, right. I, I definitely bought one paper. Oh, um, and I'm not even embarrassed about it because that's a dumb book. I just loved writing so much that my senior year in high school, I decided I wanted to take two AP English classes <laughs> instead of one AP English class and an AP math. I was like, I don't need calculus. This is dumb. I'm going to go to theater. Bye. Bye. Um, so they let me do it. So by the time I got to college, all the seniors were coming to me to be like, will you edit my paper for yeah. fill in the blank class? And I was like, yeah. Maybe I bought one of your papers. And what I realized, <laughs> no, I never sold my papers. I edited other people's. But I was like, God, I should have been charging for that. That is like valuable help. I Ugh. legitimately paid fifty dollars for, for a paper. Gulliver's travel. Oh my paper. god! And so when I see all this shit about Brooke cheated on a test, I just don't care. I don't even care a little bit. I'm like, babe, graduate, get out of there. Well, You're gonna be great. I just, I wish there was like more emphasis put, rather than on your paper or on your midterm. I wish we put more emphasis on actually learning the information. On the ability to digest complex ideas and think critically and engage in conversation and debate with people. Could you imagine where our political system would be if we could actually just talk to each other instead of be like, the answer is B. No, it's B, man. Like, it's so dumb. Well, also the fact that you were totally reliant. Brooke was totally reliant Mm -hmm. on other kids to help her pass this class. Like, where's the Where's the teacher? My calculus teacher, senior year in high school, I did well in the class, but I wasn't an Mm. A student. And he heard that I wasn't going to take the AP exam at the end of the year because I was taking all these other AP exams and Mm -hmm. I just didn't feel like failing it. I knew I was going to fail it. And he was like, Hillary, 
you have to take it. I'm doing after school tutoring sessions. I will personally help you. And mm. Bruce Snyder, God bless that math teacher, um, made sure that I passed that AP exam. And I felt so good about myself after the fact, but it's the only reason I passed it is because an adult intervened. Mm. And had Brooke had that experience, where instead of it being the yeah. boy that she's kissing, it's like an adult that sees this kid doesn't have a lot of parental interaction. She's mm. trying really hard. She's the president of this club, you know? Yeah. If an adult had showed up and been like, baby, I believe in you, and you had to lie to that adult about cheating, Oof. that would have been fun. That would have been, that would have been nice. Yeah, like, we had so many good teachers in real life. I wish we'd had good teachers yeah. on the show. We had I Whitey. do, too. And it's weird because every once in a while we had a great experience and then they would disappear. Even Principal Turner, he's so militant in this episode. And, <laughs> you know, him firing Haley felt so, it just felt so unfair. He yeah. knows her character. It felt like Haley was a student he'd met for the first time. And... For her to be able to say, I had a feeling and I checked for my keys and, and whatever else, it all just felt like a device that I didn't love. I will say the device of Joy bitch slapping Daniil worked great. Oh, my God. Whoever like coordinated her, that she stunt. She was slamming the key down on oh, the table when Turner wanted it back. And then yeah. she flapped the <laughs> sh out of Rachel. It was so funny. And I loved watching the boys kind of be like, damn, Haley, mm -hmm. that was a great that was a really great, fun Well, and I love the moment. way Antoine dismissed Rachel from the party because it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't like, you don't belong here. It was just like, time to go, mama. Yeah. You know, like it was firm and safe. And yeah. I love the way that that was all handled. And I, I get why Haley slapped her. Haley's getting a different set of information than the viewer. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to be like, Haley, lighten up. Because yeah. her set of information is like, this chick is problematic at yeah. every turn. Yeah. Well, and she's coming for all of my stability. My husband, my job, my school. My best friend. Yeah, all the things. Yeah, all the things. Nah. I want to talk about Peyton and Lucas because I, I mean, I say this all the time. Like the fan base is like, you never address it. Like we're finally in a great place. I don't love I like Peyton it. and Lucas when they're sneaking around, you know, no. but Peyton and Lucas, like in a decided relationship, we're mm -hmm. going to be together. Mm -hmm. I love his interactions with Glenda in this yes. episode. I love that Peyton wasn't jealous but was like, what book did you get that girl? Like, yeah. there's a little bit of just like, oh, do you want to tell me about it? Yeah, she's like, well, what don't, what don't I know? Yeah. Knows that he's lying and doesn't call him out. <laughs> yeah. What I love about it, you know what it really reminded me of? Um, remember early on when Brooke and Lucas are dating and Peyton says, give him this CD. And Brooke does, and she's like, oh, yeah, track 13. And he, he comes to you and says, there is no track 13 on this record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I know this is you, you gave her this. It's a callback to that for me. And the nostalgia is so sweet. And I can see how much fun you're having. Like, I, I, I actually made a note about how, you know, Lucas gave his book to Glenda, but didn't tell Peyton it was done. Like, what? Mm -hmm. And instead of being upset, she, she plays with him. She thinks it's cute. Well, she wants to get in there in a way that is fun. It's not threatened or threatening. And and it goes back in every direction with you two. It feels nostalgic. It feels sweet. It feels pure. I liked it because, to your point, so many of the relationships on our show are based in threat. It's like mm -hmm. someone's going to find out I'm lying. Someone's going to find out I did this thing. Someone's going to mm -hmm. find out, find out, find out. And Peyton and Lucas, because they were in the friend zone for a long time, have developed this rapport of like, I could find out whatever about you. I'm still into you. You know, mm -hmm. like, tell me the worst thing you did. I know, mm -hmm. you know, thanks for telling me, but I already know. Um, yeah. And there was so much physicality between our characters, you know, like mm -hmm. it, we'd had years of like, are they or not? 
are they or yeah. aren't they, you know, stolen kisses, all that kind of bullshit. Once the floodgates were opened, <laughs> they were just like, you two are just going to suck face, like all episode. And the fans are going to love it. So do that. And I said to you, when when Peyton and Lucas go upstairs to the bedroom at Nathan's house, I was like, <laughs> why did they not have sex at Lucas's house where there was like some level of privacy? They're the only yeah. two people in the house. He's like, my mom's not coming home. Why do they go <laughs> to a house party with a hundred <laughs> people downstairs at her ex-boyfriend's house where she used to have sex with him? Yeah. To finally hook up is just embarrassing. But shooting that scene with yeah. my boyfriend and my brother and my boyfriend's dad and his uncle and like the entire crew that I was related to it for one way or another, watching was such a oh god cringy experience. <laughs> and so Chad was a great sport about it. He knew how weird it was for me to have the people yeah. yelling, rolling, and cut be the people that I like lived with. Yeah. Um, and so well, he, and your actual boyfriend. Yeah. Like you're shooting a scene with your TV boyfriend and your actual boyfriend is watching. Oh yeah. my God. He's the one yelling, rolling. I we know. Were like, oh, it's a no. nightmare. I'm so, so uncomfortable. So they would yell cut, but this is an embarrassing story. I hope Chad doesn't get upset. I tell the story. There was one point where his beard hair got caught on my bra and it pulled my bra away a little bit and Chad freaked out. And was just like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And it like ruined the tape. And I was like, look, he, I don't think anyone saw it. But he was worried that other people saw it and didn't want to play it off like no big deal. Like it was and no it, big so deal. It oh no. Of like, of like, who saw that? Did anyone? It was so uncomfortable. And he was trying so hard to be like above board. And I'm like, you're making it a big deal. I'm you're really going to need you to calm yeah. down right Oh now. my God. Yeah, this is why we have intimacy coordinators now. Um, because back then they were just like, and go. Um, but yeah, he was very, he was very courteous mm. and oh, yeah, we're just going to kiss for the next six seasons. But what I really liked about it, I liked the tenderness between the two of you in the scene in Lucas's room and that he is being a bit of a teenage boy who's like, well, why not now? Nobody's mm -hmm. coming. And mm -hmm. obviously you lean into it because the, the misdirect is that Brooke's going to interrupt. But later, what I really liked that I didn't expect was what they gave to you for Peyton. I loved hearing a girl say, I'm glad we waited. You know, mm -hmm. back then, like, look, that time, yeah, I wanted to hook up with you. And now I'm in love with you. Yeah. Now I want all the things you said you wanted. Like, it's such a beautiful moment where these two people who couldn't quite get on the same level in their growth are finally right there on the same page yeah and I loved it I thought that it was so I don't know it was just lovely like when we were watching the scene I went oh my god that was so nice I really like that for you two together well our scene listen we knew what was coming at the end of the episode. Ugh. Your anxiety kind of like <laughs> spoiled, spoiled the um, surprise. But the scene <laughs> that we had when Brooke comes into Lucas's room and interrupts mm. them hooking up, like, oh, yeah. God, how uncomfortable. Oh, her and Peyton get to connect again. Yeah. Like, God, it's exactly what you want to see between two teen girls where it's grace and it's yeah. like, I love you. It, basically, what that scene is, is these two girls saying, I love you, I love you, mm -hmm. I love you, I love you. It's hard, but I love you. Yeah. And that's the subtext for every single line yes. in that scene. Yes. I mean, Brooke saying, tell me what I have to do so you're comfortable mm -hmm. is an I love you. And Peyton saying... They're just my drawings. You made them into something. Isn't I love you? Mm -hmm. And it they, they're giving each other these gifts of, I want you to have whatever you want. And it's so, it's so nice. Well, and Peyton's addressing, the, like, there's yeah. no beat around the bush. She's like, I love him. And I mm -hmm. don't want me loving him to hurt you. 
you know, like, let's just be grown ups and talk about it. Mm-hmm. We don't even do that. <laughs> no. These little no. girls had it all figured out. Well, but what's so, what I loved about it and what felt really honest about it, even though they're teens, is because they've been in this tumult, mm-hmm. I I got the sense that Peyton said that to herself over and over again. You saying, yes, Brooke, I love him, but I never wanted my love for him to hurt you. You have you have distilled all your complicated feelings into that sentence. You've gone, you know what it is? Mm-hmm. And it's like you've been waiting to give it to me. She practices it in the car. Do you practice conversations in the car? Uh I I more I, as like a as a quirky anxious person, I more re refight. So like <laughs> I had a fight, you know, I had an argument like six years ago with some like idiot I was dating. And, and now I'm like, oh, what I should have f-ing said. Like after all these years of therapy and all the books I've read, I have the perfect answer. And then I'm like, well, that felt fun. And then it's over. Like <laughs> I don't really practice before. I probably should. I didn't know that there were people <laughs> who didn't practice before. I didn't oh. know that there were people that like don't talk it out with themselves before they talk it out with other people and i was driving in the car with my daughter having a conversation in the rearview mirror and george said who are you talking to oh (laughs) my god and i got called out by my kid i was like damn it that's embarrassing no i love that i love that you're having fights from six years ago I'm like, oof, what I should have said. Can you call me next time that happens so oh, yeah. I can just listen? Oh, absolutely. I've even done it with like, you know, you know this because you were a VJ. Like you get caught live on the air and someone oh, asks yeah. you something really yeah, shitty yeah. Uh-huh. and you're live. There's nothing yeah, you can do sucks. about it. Like what I want to do to you, I can't do to you live on the air. Mm-hmm. Oh, disrespectful idiot you know whatever (laughs) like you can't say that so you try to like crack a joke or like deflect and oh i have come up with some zingers (laughs) that i wish i had on hand at the time but i just i didn't Mm -hmm. i will say my palms are sweaty i know (laughs) i feel like i've just admitted like a deep dark i know i'm like oh god but i do think i do think it's really helpful to like (laughs) <laughs> to practice certain things ahead of time. Practice. That is something I've been learning more like in coaching. I'm like, oh, right. I, I'm allowed to do this. Mm-hmm. Like my coach literally said to me, she goes, you're an actor. You guys practice your lines before you do the scene. And I was like, yeah, what's your point? That yeah. somebody wrote those. And she's like, you can write whatever you want. And I was like, oh, <laughs> interesting. I've never given myself that permission yeah. slip. Hmm. Wow. Listen, wait till well. someone's in your car and they call you out for rehearsing. Oh, my God. <laughs> but these girls, Peyton and Brooke, have practiced their conversation. They have the most beautiful reunion. And then it's destroyed. Destroyed. The, the episode. Also, why, why is Nathan in the crowd on looking and Brooke yes. is up by the TV like it's all her fault? He did this. Yeah. Everyone he is did looking this. at Brooke like she's the s- that did this. And he's oh. the one that did it and recorded it and kept it yeah and by the way peyton runs out of bed with lucas going oh no they're watching my sex tape <laughs> like clearly nathan has a weird kink mm-hmm. and uh, suddenly it's the girls that are bad well wasn't he i don't like it porn on his computer yes yeah there's a pattern man there's nathan. a pattern you little freak you um, little dirty boy. I will say before we before his freakiness is revealed, I loved I loved that sequence with Brooke and Nathan outside. Yes. I love those two being friends. Yeah. I love cool. the glimpse into their childhood friendship, wrestling in the sprinklers and laughing like their friendship. They're so similar in a world of people who don't understand them. Yeah. I love I love seeing it. Of all the characters, they are the most similar, you know? Mm -hmm. They have the same parental issues. They have the same money issues. They have the same, I don't have money anymore issues. They have the same expectation at school issues. They are mirror images of each other. And I love the camaraderie between these two. Um, I do too. I hope, I don't, I mean, I don't remember the next episode. I remember like 
punching you, yeah. but not you, like just punching the camera. Um, yeah. But I don't know what Haley's reaction is going to be. Like, that's a weird thing to find out that someone that's been your very dear friend and made your wedding dress to your husband. Like, that's a lot. But so many years before you knew each other. No, it's like a year and a half, bro. Like, it's not that far. Oh, God. We have a listener question. Do we? From Samantha. She says, can Ooh. you walk us through the filming process a little more? How much is the script or the director saying, you'll enter here, pick up this cup, cross the room, etc., versus you getting to make those choices as an actor? Once you have the script, can you play with the lines at all? Mm. I mean, here's what I'm going to say. For the big crowd stuff, like the party, mm-hmm. the pro actor move is to walk onto set and be like, what does camera need? How can I make it work? Yeah. Because it's not just about you. It's about you and 50 other people. Mm -hmm. Um, In the crowd scenes at the party, my little brother is standing over my shoulder when the sex tape stuff is happening. And that's all I can see is my brother, John, just being like, whoa. Whoa. So, yeah, it's not about you in the big crowd scenes. When it's a scene between you and one other person, those feel like the opportunities to me where you you can collaborate with the director and be like, I feel like I'd get up right now, Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, I think a great way to illustrate that is there's the scene where Mouth and Skills are facing each other and Shelly walks in the door and, and back behind them by the doorway you know, she walks between their two heads on camera yeah. and they decide to split and then camera follows mouth and then he goes one way and camera's following Shelly and then they run into each other. That's choreography from the director. Yeah. That's the director saying, this is how I'm going to get into this party. So as an actor, you have to say, yep, I can do that. Great. Love it. And then in other aspects, you know, sometimes uh, to your point, Samantha, yes, the script says, you know, Brooke walks into the room and picks up a coffee mug because she's supposed to throw the coffee mug at Rachel or something like that will be scripted. But very often, if it's just a scene in the kitchen, props are not scripted and you get to figure it out. So it it really is a case by case basis. You know, if something is so specific um, that it needs to happen by the end of the scene, it'll be on the page. And if it doesn't, it won't. And you can figure it out. But it, it, it's not only um, director dependent how much you get to collaborate, but it's also very often decided scene by scene. I can always tell a scene that's scheduled for the end of the day yeah. because it's a one shot <laughs> of us sitting next to each other. You and yeah. I do it all the time. All We'd the be time. Like, hey, do you, do you just want us to sit next to each other and like mm. talk out into the room so we can yeah. do this in a one Uh and not everybody, not every actor goes for that. Some actors are like, no, I need my coverage. I need to get up at this point and walk across the room. And, you know, that's, n- there's a difference between performance and being production friendly. And you yeah. want to find like a good middle ground where it's like, this mm-hmm. is authentic to the character, but it's also production friendly. So we can shoot this in an hour and get everybody home. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it becomes, TV work is very, very different from movie work. Because it becomes about like technicalities and being able to do eight or nine pages a day every single mm-hmm. day and get people home on time so that the union rules are followed. Yeah. Well, and so that you can survive it. Because if you're doing a, you know, you're doing a movie for four, six, or maybe eight weeks, and that's like a Ooh. crazy long movie, a, a TV show you're shooting for 10 months a year. Yeah and you're working 16 or 17 hours a day, you do not have time to add an extra hour to the day. You just don't have it. I love so a you- director that has storyboarded their sh- and knows yes. exactly what shots they want. And I'm just uh, like, it feels like show basketball it to me. practice. I'm like, yes. show it to me. I can, I can make that shot. I'm like, oh, you're so prepared. Uh, <laughs> Give it to me. I love um, it. Who do you feel like is our honorable mention in this episode? I loved Rachel saying, Brooke, you're my friend. That was it for me because mm-hmm. I feel that way about my girlfriends from high school. Yeah. Like 
things can be really, really, really bad. And I can share a text with one of them and be like, you're my friend. And that fixes everything, Yeah, you know? Yeah, was, I love that. It was perfect. Is that yours? What's yours? Well, yes, that that was on my mind. And, and now I feel like I have to crack a joke and say, are we sure it's not Nathan Scott's nipple ring in the flashback video? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, you know how like in time it's like, like AD and BC, <laughs> like before Christ and after death. I feel like there's like before nipple ring and then post nipple ring oh in the world God. of Nathan Scott. That's how we measure time. In it is trio. so funny. <laughs> like it being in the close up when he's setting up the camcorder, mm. you're just like, oh yeah, this is this is early Tree Hill days. Gross. Yeah. Gross or awesome, one or the other. <laughs> I don't know. Poor James. Can you imagine getting like a piece of metal just? spirit gummed to your I, it's a hard no for me and uh, no one's ever asked me to do that maybe me the next either. job and i don't want it yeah <laughs> i don't want it i just talked to my son about getting gus thing about getting his ear pierced and i told jeff oh. i was gonna go with him and he's like what are you gonna get pierced and i was like <laughs> i don't know like what does a grown woman get pierced at this get another hole in your ear I might get another hole in my ear. I think he yeah, was excited fun. that I was going to get a Nathan Scott nipple ring. I mean, no. oh, oof, God. Could ass. you imagine? Ass. Oh, my God. If I do, you'll get the picture of it. Like, Okay. <laughs> that feels fair. It'll be you. Um, Great. Are we going to spin a wheel? What's Let's a spin wheel? a wheel, babe. The wine kicked in. I'm having a great time, Sophia. I know. I just finished my little baby glass, and I'm like, yeah. maybe I want another. Another? I'm going to go uh. cook dinner now. Uh, who's most likely to skip school? Well, on our show, seems like all the kids are skipping school. Nathan skips <laughs> school to go see Deb. Uh, Lucas skips school to go buy a tux. <laughs> yeah, it's like they don't even bother going anymore. Do they just have free periods? What's going on? Yeah, that's weird. Um, most likely to skip school. I feel like Nathan, he's always like yeah. doing something weird in real life. Not you, Mrs. Scott. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Not you. Not I me. I will say, the first time I, like, legitimately skipped school, it was senior year. Blair Witch Project came out, and I skipped school <gasps> with my best friend. You went to see it? I skipped school with my best friend, Erica, and my brother and his best friend, and we're, like, in my cutlass, and we drive to the movie theater, and we're like, God, I hope no one sees this. It's the middle of the day. And we watched Blair Witch Project, fully believing that it's real, because it was marketed as a documentary yeah. and not a fake movie. And we leave, and we're so unsettled, because we live in Northern Virginia, and it's very close to the Maryland woods where that shit takes place. <laughs> and oh. we're so creeped out. But then we have to pretend with our parents, like, we're fine. And fine. we had a totally normal day, and we're not creeped out. That was my school skipping experience. Ooh. I mean, Joy skips school a lot to do her soap opera. Yeah. It's her. She's a school yeah. skipper. Yeah, you're right. She, she was, was like, goodbye. Movies. She was yeah. like, I'm working and going to the fancy bar to drink champagne. I'm fabulous. Peace. She was out. <laughs> he wins. All, All right. right. Oh, Honorary school skipper. What do we got next Honorary week? school skipper. Next episode is season four, episode 15, prom night at Hater High. <sighs> I might dress up. We probably should. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a gnarly one. It's almost like the next episode to me is two episodes. There's yeah. like the flashback to the Brooke and Nathan mess. There's the big Peyton and Brooke fight that we know is coming. And then prom night means Derek is back, which feels like a, a full episode all in its own. We might have yeah. to do two. We might have to split this shit up. Guys at home, we can't, we make no promises. George has a bunch of tiaras and she just got for Christmas here. So I'm probably going to get fancy. Oh my God, <laughs> yes. Let's get fancy. I'm done. Right. Okay, Bye, friends, get fancy with us next week. We love you. Love y'all. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a review. You can also follow us on Instagram at dramaqueensoth. Or email us at dramaqueens at iheartradio.com. See, See you next time. time. We're all about that high school drama girl, drama girl, all about them high school queens. We'll take you for a ride in our comic girl, drama girl. cheering for the right team. Drama queens, drama queens, queens. my girl, rough girl, fashion with your tough girl, you could sit with us, girl. 
Drama queens, drama queens, drama queens. Drama, drama queens, drama queens.